Of all the machines of war, this one is perhaps the most useful. With the capability of performing many functions other than combat, the helicopter is as much at home in the civilian world as the military one. The concept of a helicopter-type vehicle dates back to the 4th century in China, where a child's toy was described from an earlier age to have several characteristics of a helicopter-type device. In the early 1480s, Leonardo da Vinci designed an aerial screw. Whether it was to be used to elevate a person or as some kind of parachute is unknown, for the design fails to explain how the entire device would not spin out of control. 1754, and the Academy of Sciences in Russia is given a demonstration of a spring-powered model craft with coaxial rotors. 1783, two Frenchmen, Christian de Launois and a mechanic, Bienvenu, made a model with two counter-rotating rotors made from turkey feathers. They gave a demonstration to the French Academy of Sciences the following year. Sir George Cayley developed a model of feathers but powered with rubber bands. He then used sheets of tin for rotors and springs to power them. He wrote extensively about his design and experiments which would go on to influence Alphonse Penaud, who went on to build coaxial rotor toys in 1870. One of these toys would eventually find its way into the hands of a young boy and his brother and would greatly influence their lives. Their name? The Wright Brothers. The word helicopter was eventually coined in 1861 by Gustave de Ponton d'Amecourt, a French inventor who demonstrated a small steam-powered model. From the French hélicoptère, it originated from the Greek helix and pteron, wing. An unmanned model flew to a height of 13 meters in 1877, a steam-powered design by Enrico Forlanini. In 1885, Thomas Edison was given a thousand US dollars by James Bennett, Jr. to develop a helicopter. Edison built a model and tried to power it with gun cotton in an internal combustion engine. The experiment failed with the serious injury of a worker after several explosions. Edison believed an engine with a ratio of three to four pounds per horsepower produced would be required to make a rotor function correctly a power output beyond the available technology of the day. Another inventor, Jan Bahil, continued with the use of an internal combustion engine to power his model helicopter, which in 1901 reached a height of half a meter. Thomas Edison, a master of patent law, went on to patent a helicopter design powered with gasoline in 1908. The design never flew, but it was perhaps the patent control that was the real invention possibly enabling Edison to overcome an adversarial design if it had such components. In 1906, two brothers, Jacques and Louis Breguet, began utilizing airfoils in their helicopter designs. In 1907, the gyroplane number one was created. Although there is a discrepancy on the date, somewhere between 14th August and 29th September, the gyroplane lifted its pilot off the ground by over half a meter, and held him there for a minute. Although extremely unstable and requiring a man at each corner to hold the airframe steady, it is considered to be the first tethered flight of a helicopter. Paul Cornu also in 1907 produced the Cornu helicopter. It utilized two six-meter counter-rotating rotors powered by a 24-horsepower engine. 13th November, it lifted off the ground and remained airborne for 20 seconds with the inventor at the helm. This was the first untethered free flight of a helicopter. The machine would eventually achieve an altitude of two meters, but again proved unstable and the design was dropped. In the early 1920s, Argentine inventor Raul Pateras Pescara demonstrated cyclic pitch for the first time. Coaxial counter-rotating biplane rotors could be warped to cyclically increase and decrease the lift they produced. It also allowed the aircraft lateral movement without a separate propeller to provide push. He also demonstrated auto-rotation, 
or how a helicopter could land safely after engine failure. In 1924, Pescara's third helicopter design flew for 10 minutes. The first world record held by a helicopter was set by another Frenchman, Etienne Michel. On 14th April 1924, he flew his helicopter 360 meters. Not to be outdone, Pescara beat that record, flying 736 meters at a height of 2 meters in 4 minutes and 11 seconds. Omishan encountered with another flight of 14 minutes covering over 1.5 kilometers at heights up to 50 meters. In Spain, Juan de la Cierva developed the practical rotor system in 1923 with his autogyro. After several accidents with deficient designs, he eventually came up with rotor hinges and drag hinges to compensate for the flapping motion of his rotors. These two combined to create a stable rotor disc in both hover and forward flight. A Dutch aeronautical engineer by the name of Albert Gillis von Baumhauer flew his prototype rotorcraft in September 1925. It incorporated both a collective and cyclic control system for his rotors. He received patents for his design in 1927. 1930 saw Italian engineer Corradino da Scagno build a coaxial helicopter, DAT-3. This two-bladed, counter-rotating blade machine was very large and utilized servo tabs on the trailing edge of the rotor blades. He also added three small propellers to the airframe to assist in control. He reached an altitude of 18 meters in a flight lasting over 8 minutes 45 seconds. Dascania would go on to design another form of transport equally as successful, the Vespa scooter. Also in the 1930s, Soviet engineers Boris Yuryev and Alexei Cherimukhin were working on a single rotor helicopter using a tubular open frame design with a four-bladed rotor and two sets of anti-torque rotors, one at either end of the airframe. They used two rotary radial engines of First World War vintage. It made several successful low-level flights and in August 1932 managed to get their design to an unofficial altitude of 605 meters. 1933, and another Russian engineer, Nicolas Florine, built a twin rotor machine and attained an altitude of 6 meters and flew for 8 minutes. He utilized co-rotating rotors to relieve the stress on the airframe and compensated by tilting the rotors in opposite directions. It was the most stable design to date. Also in 1933, the Breguet d'Oran gyroplane laboratoire was built. It flew in 1935 and set many records, including a height record of 158 meters and an endurance record of one hour, two minutes and five seconds. The autogyro, shown in these historical films. It required a propeller for power, since the rotor was freewheeling and couldn't hover. Many devices first developed for autogyros are being used in today's helicopter. Once again, the pre-war Germans were advancing technology on several fronts. Jet aircraft research, ballistic rockets, and now helicopters. The Focke Wolf FW61 first flew in 1936 and broke every world record ever held for helicopter flight. In 1937, it demonstrated capabilities previously only achieved by autogyros. And in 1938, Hannah Reich became the first female helicopter pilot. Nazi Germany would use a small number of helicopters during the war for observation, transport and medical evacuation. Two other models were produced, the Flettner FL282 Cobri Syncropter and the Focke Achilles FA223 Drache. Due to extensive Allied bombing, none were able to be produced in any quantity. It would not be until 1942 that a helicopter design would reach full-scale production. Igor Sikorsky was in competition with W. Lawrence LePage to produce a military helicopter for the United States. LePage took the German design and produced the XR-1, Sikorsky's simpler design, the VS-300, later developed into the R-4, became the winning design. Igor Sikorsky's single main rotor with a small anti-torque tail rotor would go on to become the recognized version of a helicopter. 131 aircraft were built. The R-4 saw service during the Second World War in areas of harsh terrain like Burma and Alaska, 
and was used primarily for rescue operations. Later models, the R5 and R6, would replace these earlier models, and by the end of the war, over 400 had been built. Bell Aircraft enlisted the design and talents of designer Arthur Young to design a helicopter using his semi-rigid, teetering blade rotor design, which used a weight-stabilizing bar. The end result was the Bell Model 30 helicopter. The Model 30 demonstrated the simplicity of design that soon became the Model 47 and was certified for civilian use in the US. It would go on to become the most popular helicopter for 30 years. The first airmail service in 1947 was begun in Los Angeles. Very rapidly, the helicopter began to be absorbed into day-to-day -day life. The need for an aircraft independent of huge airfields is being met today by the helicopter, which can land in any area big enough for its whirling rotor. Helicopters are being used today for a wide variety of jobs, which can't be handled by other aircraft. In larger cities, they are delivering thousands of pounds of mail every day from outlying airports directly to the post office. These craft can carry some 400 pounds of mail on each trip, and in some cities, trips are made throughout the day at 20-minute intervals. Between 1947 and 1951, several competing designs were put into production. Particular emphasis was given to military contracts, although civilian uptake was just as enthusiastic. The Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw helicopter first flew in 1949. A general purpose craft, it was picked up by the US Army and Air Force. The design was so successful that it was also licensed to Westland aircraft in the United Kingdom who built the Westland Whirlwind. The US Navy and Coast Guard had their craft designated HO-4S and the US Marines had their HRS. The design was also licensed in France and Japan and the model was flown in many countries. There are a number of different kinds of helicopters being flown today. Some are designed with two rotors which turn in opposite directions. Each rotor counteracts the torque action of the other and thus eliminates the need for an anti-torque tail rotor. Twin rotor helicopters have been built large enough to carry 16 persons with a gross weight of more than 14,000 pounds. In New York City, the world's first scheduled passenger helicopter airline inaugurates new service with twin rotor whirlybirds. The big ships carrying 15 passengers go into shuttle service between Manhattan and New York's outlying airports. For the air travelers, it offers a spectacular sightseeing ride from a tandem rotor flying banana. The Soviet Mil Mi-1 was designated Hare by NATO forces, a light four-seat utility helicopter. The designer, Mikhail Mil, began work on the rotary aircraft in 1930. Various early models were developed, although they did borrow several ideas from the Sikorsky S-51. There were many versions developed for the Soviet and Polish military. Helicopters gave entertainment of a lighter sort. Joff and his henchmen were there, glowing with pride throughout the two-hour show. Attempts were made to introduce jet engines to the rotors of some models. The rotor blades works much like a fireworks pinwheel. The jet engines are the only source of power. Jet helicopters are simpler in construction, lighter and easier to operate than conventional helicopters, although fuel consumption is very high. Although this concept was pushed hard, it did not catch on. The continued development of this and other types of helicopters, with their unprecedented freedom of movement and the wide range of uses to which they can be put, hold great promise for the future of transportation. 
Prince Bernhardt is among the interested spectators viewing a demonstration of a new Dutch ramjet helicopter. The little jet engines are mounted in the tips of the rotors, eliminate complicated piston engines, clutches, and transmissions, and a self-adjusting rotor results in remarkable flight characteristics. There's something out of this world about the little whirlybird at night with flames shooting out from the four rotor blade tips. You might see one some night and say, why, that's a flying saucer. One British design gyroplane, the Fairy Rotodyne, was destined for commercial and military applications in the early 1950s. It featured a tip jet powered rotor which burned fuel and compressed air redirected from the wing mounted engines. The main rotor was used for vertical takeoff and landing, while the two turboprop side mounted engines provided full forward thrust. Although ungainly in appearance, it passed all the required trials for military service, but a lack of commercial sales led to its demise. In 1951, the US Navy asked Charles Carman to modify the K-225 helicopter with a new kind of engine. The turboshaft engine had many advantages over piston engines, including a reduction in weight and complexity and an increase of usable power. Carman produced the K-225 with a single turbine engine in 1951 and later another model, the Navy HTK-1 in 1954 with two turbine engines. But it was the Sud Alouette II that would become the first mass-produced turbine-powered helicopter. A further development for Sikorsky was the H-34, also known as the turbine-powered Westland Wessex in Britain and built under license. Adopted across the US military and other nations, it was employed for anti-submarine operations, troop transport, and for picking up the odd stray astronaut. In the field, the rapid tactical deployment of men to combat zones fully equipped and ready to fight was a development for which commanders could see great potential. The cavalry giving up their horses for helicopters. Here's one built by Westland Aircraft. Looks like a flying concrete mixer, doesn't it? Time now for the flying. A tiny Skeeter helicopter shows that even waltzing is within its scope. Like a runaway express train, the Bristol 173, the flying railway carriage, goes through its paces. Armed helicopters are helicopters that have been taken from another function, such as recon or transportation, and armed with either machine guns, bombs or rockets, and tasked as an assault vehicle in the air-to-ground role. This first occurred informally during the Korean War, when US Marines would fire from the open doors of the helicopter. Coming in to land in an unknown or hostile environment, the soldiers would strafe the surrounding trees. This was developed further by the French in Algeria and then later in Indochina. Between 1954 and 1962, the French military utilized several helicopters in the assault role. They used the Bell 47 helicopter with two machine gunners taking up position on the stretcher panniers. This gunship had insufficient power to assault the high peaks and mountains. They were tasked to reach inaccessible guerrilla positions. The Piaseki H-21 was fitted with rocket launchers and machine guns and even a bomb rack, but they lacked the performance to be effective assault vehicles. They were eventually just fitted with side-mounted machine guns for self-defense. The CH-34 was effectively used in the ground attack role, although due to the location of its fuel tanks was considered less capable to survive ground fire than the CH-21. Both were combined in counterinsurgent roles in attack and troop transport. Helicopters became natural sub-hunters, and several navies around the world began to fit out helicopters for this role. They could carry magnetic anomaly detectors and depth charges. 
the U.S. Army began fitting rocket pods and machine guns to the larger Sikorsky. Battle-weary feet, a soldier's nemesis. The brief pause allows communication with the ever-present field choppers, which pick up both allied wounded and the captured enemy. With the helicopter becoming more involved in troop transport, helicopters needed the ability for both close support of infantry on the ground and fire suppression roles, particularly when transporting troops into hot zones of battle. UH-1B Huey was mounted with far rockets and machine guns. The US then upgraded the engines to cope with the added weight. The Soviet Union also saw this need for close ground support could be tasked to helicopters and took the Mil Mi-8 and added rocket pods. These developed into the Mil Mi-24, which saw extensive service in Afghanistan in the 1980s. But it was the Vietnam conflict that saw the true power and capability of the helicopter fully integrated into military service and set the pace for the future of this war machine. Armed troop transport vehicles carried cabin-mounted machine guns and side-mounted rocket pods and would assault enemy positions before landing and deploying troops. They would then lift off and provide close support air cover for the troops. The that could not be met by the new Black Hawk was tasked to a small, light, single-engine aircraft called Little Bird. This small, light observation helicopter was a world record holder in speed, endurance and climbing capability and was perfect for special operations. With a five-blade main rotor, it was relatively quiet as well. Used to move special operations troops about, they also carried snipers and were involved in many covert operations as well as more general use in numerous combat scenarios. The Boeing CH-47 is a tandem rotor heavy lift helicopter with twin engines. It can reach speeds of 315 kilometers per hour. Used primarily for transport, its large ramp allows for rapid deployment of vehicles upon landing in combat zones. It is also a highly valued medical evacuation vehicle because of its internal capacity. Large numbers of casualties can be lifted and medical aid can be given whilst in flight. The very success of this model has seen it adopted by many Western forces and it is still a mainstay heavy lift helicopter today. They can be armed with crew operated cabin machine guns. Likely the first organized use of a helicopter as a bomber would have been during the Vietnam War. The US Army used Iroquois Chinook and Tarhee helicopters to deliver bombs to targets where conventional bomber aircraft were either impractical or unavailable. CH-47 was used chiefly to clear out bunkers and used an improvised bomb, a 55-gallon drum of CS powder. 30 could be carried by a Chinook. Using the M156 universal mount, cluster bomb and mine dispensers were fitted to helicopters. Standard 60 and 81 millimeter mortars were also utilized, simply being dropped from the helicopter. 
The U.S. Army also tested the Chinook with large bombs, the M121 10,000-pound bomb and the BLU 82B 15,000-pound bomb, although the C-130 was found more appropriate to use these large land-clearing bombs. Soviet helicopters were also evaluated to be bomb carriers and have qualified their MIL MI-8 and MI-24 to carry such loads. The UH-60 Black Hawk and its naval variant the Sea Hawk were developed by Sikorsky aircraft to replace the older Huey utility helicopter. The Black Hawk is a general purpose medium lift twin engine four blade helicopter. It can perform operations from troop movement and medical evacuation to electronic warfare, as well as close support fire when armed or anti-submarine duty for the naval variant. The Black Hawk can move up to 11 fully equipped combat soldiers or lift one 105 mm howitzer piece with ammunition. Stub wings can be fitted to support additional fuel tanks or weapons loads. It was first in service with the US Army in 1979 and first saw combat in the invasion of Grenada in 1983. It remains today in many military services around the world as the main medium-class helicopter. An attack helicopter is one specifically designed to carry weapons for attacking ground targets. These weapon systems can include Gatling guns, machine guns, rocket pods and missiles. The two primary roles are to provide close air support for ground troops and perform an anti-tank role. They can also perform armed reconnaissance and escort duties. 1965 and US forces using armed helicopters required a purpose-built attack helicopter. Their first choice was the Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne design. Other aircraft were selected for evaluation, including Sikorsky S-61, Karman H-2 Tomahawk, and Bell Huey Cobra to fill their requirements until the Cheyenne was ready. Finally, April 1966, the Huey Cobra was selected for this role, which it performed for several years in Vietnam as the Cheyenne program developed issues and setbacks. The Cheyenne program was finally cancelled in favour of the advanced attack helicopter AHH. Troops would be inserted on the ground or by support helicopter. We would escort those insertions um, and then really provide top cover or pre-planned fires perhaps or reconnaissance to the troops as they move through. We tried to give them awareness of what was going on, looking into areas that they can't see to deter, importantly, uh, to deter attacks, um, to deliver the, the non-shooting effects, which um, we provide surprisingly well. Uh, and then ultimately, if there was a requirement to do so um, and the uh, friendlies came under fire, then we would provide the um, fire support necessary to allow them to continue to um, deliver their task. The anti-tank rule was adopted by missile-armed helicopters which could pop up and fire in almost any terrain. The US Marines fielded the AH-1 Cobra and Super Cobra for their close support roles. Other modern equivalents are the Tiger UHT of the German Army and the Westland WAH-64 Apache Longbow of the British military. Developed by Hughes Helicopters, the twin-engine AH-64 was built from the ground up as a weapons platform. This is an army helicopter flown and operated by the army. So in some respects, we already know how to do that integration. Um, we're, we are a piece of the army, an integral piece. So there was less to learn, really, for the troops on the ground because we do a lot of that for them. The whole point is that, that we're doing that operation. 
that said, uh, I think that you know we're in a learning business and we're a learning organisation and people learn fast when the pressures are on how to best use the capabilities at their disposal and they've done that to very good effect. Features include four-blade main rotor, reverse tricycle landing gear and a tandem cockpit for a crew of two. First flown in October 1975, its weapon systems are state-of-the-art, beginning with the nose-mounted target acquisition and night vision sensor suite. Its main weapons are a 30mm chain gun mounted under the nose and between the landing gear. Stub wing pylons hold four hard points for a mix of rocket pods and missile systems, including the Hellfire missile. Built to withstand multiple hits, the triple redundant systems allow for a high crew survivability in combat situations. We're there very much to support the guys on the ground and, and wherever we can help them, particularly out of the tightest spots, that's what we're designed to do. Uh, and that is what we do very well, to be honest. We're, we're very good at um, seeing things clearly, clearer than they can see them from the ground by virtue of our perspective, our situational awareness. And uh, as a result, we can be much more discriminate. We can pick weapon systems very carefully so as to be proportionate and to minimize collateral damage. The Russian answer to the Apache was the Black Shark or KA-50, introduced into service in 1995. NATO badge the Hokum A, it's a unique single-seater attack helicopter with a coaxial rotor design to give it high speed and maneuverability. It is armed with a suite of weapons on four external hard points, including 12 laser-guided VIKHR anti-tank missiles with a range of 8 kilometers. The main cannon is 30 mm caliber and semi-fixed to the aircraft with very little room for movement. The aircraft rotates by helmet control to aim the weapon. The entire aircraft can turn as fast as the gun turret on the American Apache. Variants and developments of the Black Shark include the KA-52 Alligator, which is a two-seater side-by-side cockpit with additional antennae and sensor packages. The Mil Mi-28 is a Russian all-weather attack helicopter designed specifically for anti-tank and anti-helicopter operations. Developed from the Mi-24, which had a carrying capacity of eight men, the cabin was removed and a higher performance achieved by the new model. A classic single rotor with a counter-torque tail rotor, the Mi-28 was delayed from entering service because of the KA-50 development. A later variant was to be sold to Iraq, but this sale fell through due to the Gulf conflict. A new version, Mi-28N, with improved night vision capability and advanced radar and FLIR capability, entered service in 2006. And along with the Apache Longbow is the pinnacle of this branch of war machine. The use of an aerial platform to spy on one's enemies is not a new concept. In fact, the French revolutionaries used balloons to observe enemy maneuvers, and in particular during the 1794 conflict with Austria at the Battle of Fleurus. The first fixed-wing reconnaissance in combat conditions took place during the Balkans War of 1912. Greek and Bulgarian Albatross aircraft were used. During World War I, the Humpler Taube was used for surveillance and photography. Fred Zinn used the Taube, with its translucent wing, to fly above enemy positions above 400 meters, where the aircraft was difficult to spot from the ground. The French called it the invisible aircraft. These aircraft detected the advance of the Russian army at the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914. Prior to the Second World War, longer range bomber aircraft were utilized for photographic reconnaissance missions. They retained their armament for self-defense. In 1939, the Japanese built the Mitsubishi Ki-46. Armed with only a single machine gun facing to the rear, it was an effective reconnaissance aircraft. It entered service in 1941. The concept of using light, fast, high-altitude aircraft for reconnaissance was introduced in 1939. 
This was necessary to avoid enemy detection or interception, thereby improving their capability. Spitfires and Mosquitoes and the America P-38 and P-51 Mustang were pressed into service. Stripped of weaponry with modified engines for improved altitude performance and repainted in sky camouflage colors, these aircraft were fitted with cameras. At altitudes above 40,000 feet, the cameras had to be heated, and the British developed an effective system, allowing them to fly up to 100 recon flights a day at very high altitudes over enemy locations without detection. After World War II, modified bombers were once again employed in the reconnaissance role. With the advent of jet power, these craft, the English Electric Canberra and the US Martin B-57, could travel further, faster and higher than their predecessors. In the late 1950s, the US and Lockheed began construction of the secret U-2 spy plane, specifically developed to fly over Soviet airspace. Nicknamed the Dragon Lady, the single-engine aircraft looked more like a glider than a jet fighter. With a flight ceiling of 21,000 meters, it was thought that no Soviet fighter could touch it. The U-2 flights would regularly fly over Soviet ICBM fields and other military installations and photograph them. The Soviets tried many times to intercept, but were unable to, until 1st May 1960. Secret reconnaissance of Russia by high-flying American U-2 jets ended when one was downed deep in Soviet territory. Its pilot, Francis Powers, was made the subject of a showcase trial. Powers' family was in the courtroom as Russia began massive exploitation of this propaganda windfall. Powers' conviction was inevitable, and the U-2 affair became Khrushchev's pretext to torpedo the Paris summit conference. But Mr. K's ultimatums to the big three overplayed his propaganda advantage. When officials stated, after firing a volley of 14 SAM missiles, the Soviets had shot a U-2 plane down. The pilot bailed out and was captured. Gary Powers, a pilot under the employ of the CIA, was tried for espionage. The Powers showcase was a propaganda hit for the Soviets and a major embarrassment for the Eisenhower administration, who had previously denied such flights or aircraft existed. The Soviets made maximum points by televising the proceedings live around the world. Powers was found guilty of espionage against the Soviet Union and sentenced to 10 years in prison. 21 months later, he and another American captive were exchanged for Soviet spy Rudolf Abel in Berlin. In 1957, convicted Russian spy Rudolf Abel was sentenced to 30 years, escaping the death penalty after his attorney argued that the United States might want to swap Abel for an American at some future time. Now, Abel has been exchanged for U-2 pilot Gary Powers. It was not for many years that the truth of the shootdown came to light. Apparently, a volley of 14 SA-2 missiles were fired, but they only managed to shoot down a pursuing MiG-19. A Soviet pilot in a stripped-down Sukhoi Su-9 managed to reach the same altitude as the spy plane, but with no weapons, managed to fly close enough to the U-2 to catch it in its slipstream. The unstable U-2, with a very high stall speed, flipped over and snapped off its wings. Two planes touched down at RAF Upper Hayford in Oxfordshire this morning at intervals of about 20 minutes apart. They've covered the 2,950 miles from Plattsburgh, New York, in seven hours. That's an average speed of about 420 miles an hour. This is the plane that Gary Powers was shot down in over Russia. On 27 October 1962, during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, another U-2 was shot down. The Cubans used a Soviet SA-2 Guideline SAM missile. This time, however, the pilot, Major Rudolf Anderson, Jr., was killed. The United States has successfully developed an advanced experimental jet aircraft, the A-11, which has been tested in sustained flight at more than 2,000 miles an hour and at altitudes in excess of 70,000 feet. The performance of the A-11 far exceeds that of any other aircraft in the world today. The development of this aircraft has been made possible by major advances in aircraft technology of great significance for both military and commercial applications.
In the 1960s, the SR-71 Blackbird was developed under a cloak of secrecy. This long-range strategic reconnaissance aircraft could reach speeds of Mach 3 and a sustained altitude of 24 kilometers. The design technology was a flow-on from the Valkyrie bomber project. An early development was the Lockheed A-12 recon aircraft produced for the CIA from designs by Clarence Kelly Johnson and tested at Groom Lake in the Nevada desert. The A-12 was produced between 1962 and 1964. It saw service from 1963 to 1968. The SR-71 was designed to operate at high speeds and altitudes, which caused some unusual anomalies when the craft was on the ground. The fuselage panels of titanium were loose-fitting when cold. Only when the aircraft was in high-speed flight and the panels heated would they expand and secure the body. The airframe would grow several inches in length during flight. This also extended to the fuel system, so when on the ground, the aircraft would leak aviation fuel everywhere. Once airborne, the SR-71 would do some high-speed passes, the air friction heating the body, sealing the fuselage, then the craft would refuel mid-air before proceeding off onto its mission. To keep the leading edges of the wings cool during sustained flight, fuel was pumped through pipes under the wing's surface, reducing the temperature. Early stealth technology was incorporated into the Blackbird design, but this proved ineffective as the aircraft's heat signature at Mach 3.2 was huge. There were over 4,000 attempts to shoot down the SR-71. None was successful. The aircraft's evasion plan for missile attack was simply to accelerate. No missile at the time could catch it. A total of 32 were built before budgets and politics stopped its production. However, satellite technology, although more expensive, had a very low maintenance cost, unlike the part-strapped SR-71. And soon, satellite surveillance was the norm. The US is claimed to have developed a hypersonic spy plane called the Aurora, although these claims are still being denied. Maritime surveillance is an area that still relies on aircraft such as the Nimrod MR2 and PC Orion to locate submerged threats such as strategic nuclear-armed submarines. Developed from the Avro Lincoln bomber, the Shackleton was the British answer to maritime surveillance in the early 50s. Employed in several roles, the four-engine aircraft with counter-rotating propellers suffered from its Griffin engines, noisy, thirsty, and requiring constant maintenance. Apart from anti-submarine and surveillance missions, it was later adapted for airborne early warning and search and rescue missions. The Hawker Siddeley Nimrod effectively replaced the Shackleton in 1968. A development from the de Havilland Comet commercial airliner, the Nimrod had a main fuselage weapons bay capable of delivering torpedoes, mines and bombs. The aircraft can also carry the Harpoon missile and Sidewinder missile for self-defense. It is still active today. Purpose-built, the Breguet Atlantique has been adopted by several NATO countries. Capable of carrying either nine torpedoes, 12 depth charges or four Exocet missiles, it conducted extensive anti-submarine and maritime surveillance missions, although the model suffered engine failures and the loss of several aircraft. It was replaced by the P-3 Orion. The Tupolev Tu-95 was, from the outset in 1953, a strategic nuclear delivery platform. This four-engine turboprop with counter-rotating propellers is the fastest and only nuclear-armed prop-driven plane in the world. The design has been upgraded over the years and the weapon systems improved and updated, but the main aircraft design remains as capable as ever and lent itself to the maritime reconnaissance role. Today, the Tupolev Tu-95MR, known to NATO as the Bear E variant, has a main role in photo reconnaissance, while its Tu-126 variant is an airborne early warning aircraft. The American Lockheed Ventura saw extensive service in the Second World War and was the antecedent of a long line of maritime surveillance aircraft. The PV-1 Ventura gave way to the PV-2 Harpoon. It had an increase in load carrying capability and was fitted with rockets under her wings. 
The models and their variants saw extensive service for the Pacific nations during hostilities. The P-2 Neptune was the next evolution by Lockheed. Introduced in 1947, this land-based aircraft was both piston and jet powered. Sold to several nations in numerous variants and marks, it was retired from US service in 1978. The P-3 Orion was introduced in 1962 to fulfill all the requirements of maritime surveillance, including anti-surface warfare as well as anti-submarine warfare. The Orion is powered by four Allison T-56 turboprops, giving it a speed greater than some turbofan jets. It can carry in its bomb bay various torpedo and nuclear-armed weapons. Underwing pylons can carry harpoon and slam missiles, including the Maverick and, until recently, the Bullpup guided missile. Serving in several navies, the US Navy P-3 is scheduled to be replaced in the coming years with the Boeing P-8 Poseidon. Several Orions were upgraded with electronics and redubbed EP-3 Ares for Airborne Reconnaissance Integrated Electronic System. In April 2001, an Ares was involved in a collision with a Chinese interceptor over Hainan Island. The Ares obviously engaged in some covert surveillance. The Chinese pilot was killed and the Ares damaged. Almost uncontrollable, the aircraft made an emergency landing on Hainan. The crew and plane were seized, causing an international incident. After several days, the crew of the Ares were repatriated, while Chinese security forces studied the aircraft and its sophisticated equipment. The aircraft was eventually returned to the US. It is unknown how much intelligence the Chinese gained from the incident. Another notable incident involving alleged spy plane activity resulted in one of the most tense times of the Cold War. A Korean Airways flight 007 jumbo jet with 269 crew and passengers strayed into restricted Soviet airspace west of Sakhalin Island. The US had flown over this sensitive region many times previously with various reconnaissance planes. The Korean aircraft had apparently drifted off course and was intercepted by Soviet fighters under orders to shoot down the plane, killing all on board. After many denials and accusations and threats of war, the incident led to several changes in navigation procedures, including the international use of the GPS navigation system, once only used by the US military. The incident also curbed recon flights over such sensitive areas. In recent times, unmanned surveillance has been conducted by UAV unmanned drones like the RQ-4 Global Hawk, a high-altitude craft resembling the U-2, the MQ-1 Predator, and the Schweitzer aircraft helicopter. Most countries' air forces lack recon-specific aircraft and rely more on adapting transport and fighter aircraft with cameras, the F-111 a case in point. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter under development will be fitted with extensive communication and recon capability as a matter of course. The age of the manned strategic spy plane would appear to be coming to an end.